Chapter 12. It is autumn. There are not many of the old hands left. I am the last of the seven fellows from our class. Everyone talks of peace and armistice. All wait. If it again proves an illusion, then they will break up. Hope is high. It cannot be taken away again without an upheaval. If there's not peace, then there will be revolution. I have 14 days rest because I have swallowed a bit of gas. And in the little garden, I sit the whole day long in the sun. The armistice is coming soon. I believe it now too. Then we will go home. Here my thoughts stop and we'll go no farther. All that meets me, all that floods over me are but feelings, greed of life, love of home, yearnings for the blood, intoxication of deliverance, but no aims. Had we returned home in 1916 out of the suffering and the strength of our experience might have unleashed a storm. We might have unleashed a storm. But now if we go back, we will be weary, broken, burnt out, rootless, and without hope. We will not be able to find our way out anymore. And men will not understand us. For the generation that grew up before us, though it has passed these years with us already, had a home and a calling. Now it will return to its old occupations and the war will be forgotten. And the generations that has grown up after us will be strange to us and push us aside. We will be superfluous even to ourselves. We will grow older and a few will adapt themselves. Some others will merely submit and most will be be bewildered. The years will pass by and in the end we shall fall into ruin. But perhaps all this that I think is mere melancholy and dismay, which will fly away as the dust when I stand once again beneath the poplars and listen to the rustling of their leaves. It cannot be that it, is gone, that it has gone. The yearning that made our blood unquiet, the unknown, the perplexing, the, uh, the oncoming things, the 10,000 faces of the future, melodies, the melodies from dreams and books, the whispers and div divinations of women. It cannot be that this has vanished in the bombardment, in despair, in brothels. Here the trees show gay and golden, the berries of the, ro of the rowan stand red among the leaves. Country roads run white out, of the, out to the skyline, and the canteens hum like beehives with rumors of peace. I stand up. I'm very quiet. Let the months and years come. They can, make, they can take nothing from me. They can take nothing more. I'm so alone and so without hope that I can, that I can confront them without fear. The life that has borne me through these years is still in my hands and my eyes. Whether I have subdued it, I do not know. I know not. But so long as it is there, it will seek its own way out, heedless of the will that is within me. He fell in October 1918, on a day that was so quiet and still on the whole front that the army re report confined itself to a single sentence, all quiet on the Western front. He had fallen forward and lay on the earth as though sleeping. Turning him over, one saw that he could not have suffered long his face had an expression of calm, as though almost glad the end had come. This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all an adventure, for death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped shells, were destroyed by the war. The end.